Welcome to this week's TDD Weekly Report for the week ending January 3rd, 2015. Welcome to the new year. First up, this was sent to me by my friend Aaron, also known on YouTube as Gentleman's Nine. I'd been talking about backup in the past TDD reports, and this was something I even, when it was proposed, uh, talked about. It might have been even more than a year ago. This is a thing called the M Disc, and basically, it's a. Uh, they make it in a form of a DVD, but I'm just going to talk about the Blu-ray version because I don't think it's price effective to even mess around with the DVD version of this, but they make DVD uh, Blu-ray discs that, um, the best way to explain it, this is kind of an oversimplification, but you can read, they've got test results after test results, PDF files about tests on data retention and stuff, but this is something akin to using a powerful laser and etching grooves in stone. They're using inorganic, metallic, and other compounds to make this layer on the disc to be something like basically just rock. So if you can consider the fact that etchings in stone have lasted thousands of years. And uh, after you read some of the PDF files and stuff like that, you'll find out actually the substrate itself that you're etching into is not the weak link. The weak link as far as the data lasting is the fact that the polycarbonate that it's coated with is only going to have a lifespan of about a thousand years. So they say you're pretty safe if you just want to preserve something for like 200 to 300 years. Um, myself personally, I don't think they talked about this at least. I mean, there's so much material to read here on the MDisc site. You can just go to MDisc.com. As usual, all the links to everything I talk about will be down in the description. But, um, yeah, basically I think the weak link in this is going to be having the equipment to actually read the discs. Are you really sure 100 years from now if you save material that you want your ancestors to see on a Blu-ray player, are people even going to have access to Blu-ray players? For example, if I had a pristine copy of something on 8-track and I handed it to you, would you be able to play it? I mean, sure, they are still around and you might be able to get a hold of one, but for all practical purposes, um, it might be rather difficult to even play back something that was made on an 8-track tape if for some reason somebody made an 8-track tape that was that perfect. So to me, I'm thinking, yeah, maybe at least a generation or two. The main thing, you want it to last enough between one or two generations that if anybody in your family is interested in the information, they could recopy it over again. So I would say it's a good way to go. The price of the discs themselves is not too unreasonable. If you buy like three packs, they run about six, seven bucks a piece. If you buy them in bulk, you can get them down just a little bit below five bucks a piece if you buy 25 at a time. And for example, I'll put this in the link too, you can actually find a DVD player. I think this is, yeah, it's an LG Blu-ray burner for 75, under 75 bucks. I think it's something like 72, 73 bucks on Amazon. And it has the logo. If you make sure that these, um, Blu-ray burners have the M-Disc logo, then they know for sure they will burn on the disc. They say 80% of the Blu-ray burners will work that have ever been built because they have a powerful enough laser to actually etch into this stone-like material. But um, when it's something like uh, you can pick up a player like this for less than $75, bucks, um, it's rather trivial to do because it's also an effective Blu-ray player. It's an effective Blu-ray reader along with DVDs and CD backwards compatible. So if you got something you're really, really concerned about storage... This is the way to go. And next, this was sent to me by, two different people sent me this. This was sent to me by Navy Thomas 8 and Fubritsu. This is, um, originally this is a CNN article, but I'm actually reading the one that KETV in Omaha printed. They're both, both basically the same thing. I just like the layout of this one a little better. NASA's plan for floating city above Venus. And this is not quite as silly as it sounds. This is just a proposal right now. I guess NASA wanted their uh, Langley division to do a study of this just to see um, some of the advantages of it. And it does have quite a few advantages along with a, a few drastic disadvantages. But um, uh, this is uh, have astronauts live above the atmosphere and especially above the clouds of sulfuric acid on Venus. You have one advantage with Venus being close to the same size of the Earth you don't have the astronauts um, in very, very low gravity, which would lead to loss of bone material, loss of muscle tone, things like that. I mean, even floating quite a bit above the surface, they're still experiencing most of the gravity of Venus. I would like to see a little bit more um, backups before they send a human person there. I would like to see maybe three or four huge floating blimps or whatever you want to call them, little floating cities, so that the fact if one of them were to lose air or something like that, you don't go crashing down into the planet because anybody that knows what Venus is like, it's hotter than a 450 degree uh, kitchen oven. I mean, it's basically, I think like they say that lead flows kind of like a, a syrup or maybe like water on the surface. So 
it's not something you're going to be able to endure. And if you drop into the sulfuric acid clouds, that probably spells the end of your craft anyway, and then it's just a crash to the surface. But as far as a basic idea, floating cities on Venus, they and it's closer. That's the other thing, too. The other positive is Venus is closer in a, a quicker trip. So, uh, yes, yeah, it says the mean temperature is 462 degrees Celsius, 863 degrees Fahrenheit, and atmospheric pressure 92 times greater than Earth, and a cloud layer of sulfuric acid. So you'd have to stay above that. But, yeah, um, maybe something in the future it would be possible. I mean, you're up into the area where it's, uh, they said the temperature would be something like 172 degrees Fahrenheit, so um, you would have to use some kind of air conditioning cooling system, but they say that's well within our technology now to do that. But, um, yeah, probably a, a decent idea. Now, there's no, this is just basically an idea and in the planning stages, but there's no funding and NASA has given no go away. This is just basically an idea of something possible in the future that NASA could do. But I'm glad they're studying different ideas like that, too, and coming up with things. This next one is from the armorgroup.com. This is called Rhino Glass. Uh, probably most of you know on the news that uh, two police officers in New York City lost their lives to an assassination attempt while they're sitting in their cars. And uh, this company, Rhino Glass, can actually produce a type of bulletproof glass that's a little bit different than your ordinary, besides being lighter weight and not so bulky and heavy as an ordinary bulletproof glass. This has got a two-way nature to it. And... Uh, I'll show you in the picture here. You can actually, it'll actually block many types of rounds going into the car itself, but it will allow the officers to actually shoot back through the glass, and the bullet will travel the other way and go out and hopefully disable the suspect or suspects that are trying to kill the officers. But I saw in one news report that the, the Rhino Glass Company said that uh, it's normally about 25000 a car, but they could, if they had a 1,000 cars in bulk, that the New York City would... Uh, police department would give to them, they could probably do them as low as a, just slightly over $12,000 a car. And it's not necessarily that you need to have every New York City police car or in other areas like that too, say Chicago, Los Angeles, uh, places like that, you would put them in, in the more troubled areas where it would be more likely to happen. So maybe you could even get, a, get along with as few as just several hundred police cars and just assign them to the areas to where it would be most likely to happen. But yeah, if you read some of the tests and stuff like this, there's uh, different levels of uh, ballistic threat level. There's level 4, level 3, level 3A, 2. It gives you all the details here. But just the fact that it can uh, go through one way but not go through the other way is pretty fantastic. Now, I'm not talking, when we're talking bulletproof glass here, we're not talking about somebody that has some uh, light military armor piercing type of rounds and a huge rifle. That probably isn't going to be stopped by any of the conventional bulletproof glasses that uh, a police department could afford. But we're talking about threats from handguns and uh, uh, small small type of rifles and stuff like that. And next, I just wanted to tell you guys about starting Tuesday is the Consumer Electronics Show, so be sure and log on to YouTube, and all you have to type in is CES Space 2015 or Consumer Electronics Show 2015. A lot of people are covering it this year. It's going to be curved screen TVs. It's going to be 4K and beyond for television sets. A lot of automobile makers are going to be showing up now. In fact, uh, Ford and I think Mercedes-Benz are giving keynote speeches, but most of the car makers are going to be there with connected cars, so that's a big thing in the future too, especially dealing with things like distracted driving. I'm hoping myself they'll come up with some way that people can uh, still do their texting but keep their eyes on the road, maybe some kind of voice-to-text conversion because you may never get people to stop doing it, but if you get them to do it a safer way, hopefully. And last up, this is uh, as I close out the show, this is from my friend Dan. And uh, he allowed me to share his video that he posted on Facebook here. What he's doing is he's actually putting up a satellite tracking system that he built himself. He gives a little demonstration model here. He doesn't have the uh, antenna itself. He has a little model of a wire representing it because he's showing it indoors. But you use uh, components that are already out there. You don't need to be any kind of expert. If you've ever used or worked with a thing called an Arduino, it's a uh, computer controller where you can take uh, programming code and output it to real-world applications like moving things around, turning lights on and off, uh, basically just controlling a little bit of everything. So he took a combination of software, this Arduino, and then some actuators, which are things used on remote-controlled airplanes and other things like that that can move objects around, and used it to build this satellite tracking system because he is an uh, amateur radio person and he wants to actually use the satellites to communicate. Amateur radio does have the ability to communicate using satellites and to be able to get a hold of these satellites, you need to track them. And uh, 
This is not something I, I would think probably anybody with a decent high school education, if you've uh, graduated with a B or an A average in high school, I think you could put these components together. It's not like you have to do all this from scratch. Um, a lot of the stuff is out there, and he gives references to all the stuff you need. And uh, I'm sure if you're on Facebook, you could contact him, and he would probably help you with a little bit of the information to get it started yourself. So as we close off, I will give you about... 30 seconds of the video and then uh, I encourage you to go watch this video if you have more interest in it. So take care everybody. I will catch you next week. Well if you watched my last video I mentioned a software package um, that I got up on the screen here for tracking communication satellites um, and uh, I'm going to explain this. You can actually do this very inexpensively. You can do it with a uh, communicate with satellites, that is, using satellite communications. You can do it with a little handheld radio like this. Um, and you need um, an antenna. Actually, you can do it with the vertical antenna, but um, you're better off with a, a directional antenna. Um, this radio you can buy on Amazon for about $40. Here, connected to the USB port is an Arduino Uno and the software is sending the um, azimuth and elevation information for that satellite that we're tracking to the Arduino and then in turn the Arduino is controlling two model servos uh, It's kind of a mock-up of a dual axis system so there's a servo underneath here for azimuth for rotation and then this one on top is for elevation and a little piece of wire here it just kind of represents what would be an antenna uh, 